Hi. A while back, I made a video about my playthrough of Pokemon Red. It's currently the longest video I've ever made on the channel. If you haven't already, I recommend you watch that video before this one. I will be referencing Pokemon Red throughout this. You got all that? Good. Let's get to the actual topic of the video. Today, I will be playing through the second generation of Pokemon games, Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal. These games take place in the Johto region, and they are set three years after the events of Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow. You follow a new protagonist, there are 100 new Pokemon to catch, and you have 8 new gym challenges. For this video, I will be playing through Pokemon Crystal. This is the definitive version of the second generation. It changes up a few small things, but overall, it's the same experience as playing Gold or Silver. I am once again emulating it, but if you're interested, you can purchase the game from the 3DS Virtual Console. It's the easiest way to play the game nowadays, so check it out. I will be doing a Nuzlocke again, because I think they're fun. I'm using the exact same rules as last time. One Pokémon per area, and a Pokémon that faints is considered dead. I am adding one extra rule purely for the sake of variety. I will not be catching Pokémon that I've already used in my Pokémon Red playthrough. The Nuzlocke isn't the focus of the video, it's just something I'm doing for fun. This video is about my impressions and opinions on Pokémon Crystal, so keep that in mind. I think I've covered everything, so let's begin. Oh wait, before I forget again, only a Before even starting the game, I go into the options screen. There are a few new options available, like changing the text frames or the sound. I set the text speed to fast, because of course, and I set the battle style to set immediately this time. Selecting new game, you are prompted with a few questions, the first being your gender. This is actually an addition made to Pokemon Crystal. If you go back to the original Gold and Silver, you still didn't have the ability to pick your gender. For this adventure, I'm actually picking the girl, because I don't know. After that, you are asked about what the current time is. Then after that, we finally meet face to face with Professor Oak, who basically repeats exactly what he said in the first game. You get to pick out your name next. Canonically, this character's name is Chris, which is fine. Personally, I think the name I went with was pretty good too. With that done, the game can now actually start. Right off the bat, you will notice some key differences between this game and the last. For one, this is a Game Boy Color game, so we have some actual color now. We got brown, green, blue, we have all the colors. I think this game, graphically speaking, is a huge step up from Pokemon Red and Blue. The simple addition of color already makes the game look better visually, but that wasn't all they did. The user interface has received small improvements, and I feel like sprites have more detail. Pokemon sprites especially look better, and got pretty close to how they normally look. At the end of the day, it's still a Game Boy Color game, but it's a pretty nice looking Game Boy Color game. I walk downstairs and talk to my mom. She asks me what day of the week it is and if it's daylight savings time. The game prompts you with a lot of time-related questions at the beginning here. There is a reason for this, and I'll elaborate in a bit. New Bark Town is the starting town in this game. It's about as small as Pallet Town, and it even has a Pokémon lab of its own. I head to the lab and meet with Professor Elm. He wants me to meet up with someone named Mr. Pokémon, and to make traveling easier, he allows me to choose one of three Pokémon. Our starters for this game are Cyndaquil, not Cyndaquil, and definitely not Cyndaquil. Truly, we have a hard decision here. What I'm about to say may be a bit controversial. Or maybe not, I don't know. I think these are the weakest starter Pokémon in the franchise. The fact that they all stay as one typing is... unique, but not very exciting. I think their designs are okay, but nothing more. The Cyndaquil line is my favorite. I think Cyndaquil and Quilava are really cute. Typhlosion looks intimidating, but too basic for me personally. Its 3D model especially doesn't do it any favors. Totodile is cute, Bayleaf is cute, they're all just... fine. I do like these guys, but if I were to rank all of the starter Pokémon, they would be at the bottom of the list. In almost every playthrough of Johto, I choose Cyndaquil. It's my favorite of the three, and it's probably the best one to use in the main story. In this playthrough, however, I actually picked Totodile. I've wanted to use this guy for a long time, and now I can. 
I was tempted to nickname him Charizard, but I figured I should think of something more original. I went with Krunkle. Don't ask me why, I, I don't know either. Now that we have a Pokemon, our trip to Mr. Pokemon can begin. The first area, Route 29, isn't too noteworthy. At the end of the route, you can harvest this tree for a berry. I'll explain the berries in just a second. Route 29 leads into Cherry Grove City, and it's more of a small town than a city. There's this old man who offers you a tour of the place. I ignored him at first, and that was a mistake. If you listen to the old man, he'll give you a map. It's not required, but it's nice to have. Next, we have Route 30. This route has a guy here who will tell you that berries can be held and used by a Pokemon during a battle. It essentially functions like a potion that the Pokemon uses automatically. Route 30 is also the location of Mr. Pokemon's house. He gives me a mystery egg to give to Professor Elm. Professor Oak is also here, and he hands me a Pokedex. He wants me to go out and catch every single Pokemon in the region. I am willing to guess his previous attempt at this did not work out. Right as I step outside, Professor Elm calls me. He sounds pretty distraught based on the text here. I should go back and check on him. Nah, I'm sure he's fine. I leisurely stroll back home until I bump into this red-haired kid. He challenges me to a battle. Unfortunately for him, he doesn't realize that I have mastered the art of being slightly overleveled for each fight. So yeah, this fight went pretty well. Are you happy you won? Yeah. He reveals his name to be question mark question mark question mark. I suppose that is a name, legally speaking. I return to Newbark and realize that the red-haired guy actually stole the Pokemon he had from Elm's lab. I would like to point out that he went through the effort of stealing a Chikorita. Like, dude, come on, you could have at least gone with a Cyndaquil. The officer asks me for his name. I told him that his name was question mark question mark question mark, but I thought that was stupid. Instead, I'm gonna be calling him Shadow the Hedgehog, baby! Aw uh, yeah! I sure do hope nobody else has made the joke. Oh, and I give Professor Elm the mystery egg. Elm says I should go take on the Pokemon League, and since I have nothing better to do, sure, why not? I talk to mom about my new career decision, and she seems fine with the idea. Also, your mom in this game can save your money, and by saving money, I really mean she's using it to fuel her gambling addictions. With that done, our journey to become a Pokemon Master can now officially begin. I start the adventure by catching a Sentret and naming her Serpent. If you know anything about the Sentret line, you can probably guess as to why I picked that name. I also went north to Route 46 and caught a Geodude. I'm not going to use Geodude for this playthrough, but he can stick around for a bit. I return to Route 30, and here we have our first trainer battle. I should go into the battle system now. Battling hasn't changed too much between this game and the first. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this game still keeps a few glitches. But there are some important changes. The special stat has now been split into a special attack and special defense stat. This change benefits a few Pokémon, but it's mainly to nerf Psychic-type Pokémon. This game was the first to introduce the Dark and Steel types. These were added primarily as another counter to Psychic types, and some moves in Pokémon have changed typing as a result of this. The user interface has received a mild upgrade. It displays your Pokémon's gender, which most of the time means nothing, but at the bottom of your Pokémon's health, it will now display a blue bar. This tells you how much experience your Pokémon currently has, and how close it is to leveling up. It's a small thing, but I do appreciate it. It's nice to know how close your Pokémon is to their next level. Arguably, the biggest addition to battling is Held Items. Your Pokémon can now hold an item and use it in battle. Held Items can vary in their effects. Some will power up certain types and moves, while others will heal status effects. They can do a lot. Not only do you have to consider what Pokémon you bring into a fight, but now you need to consider what items they'll be holding. Maybe you'll want to give your Pokémon a berry so they can heal themselves instantly. Perhaps you'll give them a Poison Cure Berry, if you know the area ahead will have Poison-type Pokémon. More strategy now goes into battling, and I think that makes the system more engaging. It helps that this game does start off a bit harder than the first. My Pokémon got very close to dying a few times in the beginning, and I was essentially forced to use berries for some battles. I think that's a good thing, it immediately teaches the player the value of held items. In summary, battling is more or less the same. But I do like the changes they made, and it is a clear improvement. Moving on, past Route 30 is another route in a dark cave. I didn't catch anything interesting here, so let's just skip to Violet City. Violet City has our first gym and the Bellsprout Tower. I went to the tower first. I'm gonna be honest, I genuinely thought Bellsprout was a Gen 2 Pokémon for the longest time. I just looked it up, it's not, my whole life is a lie. The Bellsprout Tower exists mostly just for extra training before the gym. I mean, you do meet your rival again here, and you get HM Flash if you beat the Sage, but that's about it. Actually, I'm not even sure if you're required to visit this place. I just did it because I could. 
After the Bellsprout Tower, I briefly went to Route 36 and caught a Bellsprout. There's a person in Violet City who will trade you an Onyx for a Bellsprout. Onyx does have a new evolution, but unfortunately, it involves trading Onyx to another game. So just like Geodude, Rocky here will just sit in the sidelines. The Violet City Gym is flying type themed. You should be fine. Unless you pick Chikorita, of course. In which case, give up. The gym leader, Faulkner, has a level 9 Pidgeotto, and I think that's bullshit. One gym badge down, seven to go. <laughs> Professor Elm calls me right as I leave the gym. He wants me to stop by the Poké Center and pick up an egg. Sure, why not? Our next destination is Route 32. This is the first opportunity you can catch a Mareep. Assuming you're playing gold or silver. If you're playing crystal, yeah, screw you, have a hop-ip. Well, at the very least, Crunkle is now level 16, so he should be evolving now. Or not. Okay, fine, I'll just evolve Serpent instead. Sentret evolves at level 15 into a Furret. Furret is one of my favorite Pokémon, even if, objectively speaking, it's absolutely terrible. Here's a terrifying fact, though. According to the Pokédex, Furret is 5'11". That's taller than me. South of Route 32, you'll find this guy who is selling a Slowpoke tail for a million Poké Dollars. Oh, sweet, I'll take three. There's a Pokémon Center and the entrance to Union Cave. Take a wild guess as to what I find into this kit. Yeah, Zubat. I did say that I wouldn't catch Pokémon that I've used previously. Zubat is an exception to that rule, and you can probably guess the reason why. Since this is the second Zubat I'm using, I nicknamed her Tubat. Union Cave leads into Route 33. I find another Hoppip, and I caught this one for no real reason. I also figured out that Crunkle evolves at level 18. I'm used to having Cyndaquil evolve at level 14, that I was a bit caught off by how long it takes Totodile to evolve. Azalea Town has the next gym, but that's not what I want to focus on. Azalea Town has our reintroduction to Team Rocket. This man, Kurt, talks about how they're cutting off Slowpoke Tails by the well. He runs off to go stop them, and he immediately breaks his back. Good job, Kurt. My opinion on Team Rocket hasn't changed, but I actually really like how they're handled here. Giovanni did disband Team Rocket at the end of Pokemon Red, but of course that didn't mean they would stop operations overnight. The organization is now recouping after three years of silence, all while trying to contact their former boss. It's more small-scale, I guess, and I like it. I beat the Team Rocket grunts and they retreat. Kurt thanks me and says he can make me special Pokeballs out of Apricorns I find throughout my journey. I always forget about this feature. Kurt can make special Pokeballs depending on which Apricorns you give him. They have unique properties, too. For example, the Heavy Ball can catch Heavy Pokemon, and the Lure Ball can catch Pokemon encountered while fishing. I think having more unique Pokeballs like this was a good idea, but it takes so much time for Kurt to actually make Pokeballs that I can't really be bothered to go back to him consistently. For most Pokemon, I find the balls you can purchase in shops to be more than enough. I think it would have been better to just have these Pokeballs available in special shops or something. Anyway, with Team Rocket gone, I should probably do the gym. The gym leader uses Bug Pokemon. I was worried about the Scyther at first, but the only attacking move it has is Quick Attack and Fury Cutter. At this point, I'm starting to feel bad for the people who picked Chikorita. While walking around, the egg I was carrying hatched. Turns out it was a Togepi, aka that one Pokemon from the anime. I don't plan on using Togepi, but I do think it's a pretty cute Pokemon and ah damn it, it's another Clefairy. As soon as I try to leave Azalea Town, I have another run-in with Shadow the Hedgehog. If you were playing this game blind, I could see this rival fight here catching you off guard. Luckily, I have played this game before, so I wiped his team. Shadow rambles on about how much he hates weak Pokémon and Team Rocket. Good for you, man, now let's move on. Ilex Forest is our first forest in the game. It primarily has early game bug Pokémon that I really can't be bothered to catch. This guy tells me that he lost track of his bosses Farfetch'd. Well, that sucks for you, man, but anyway. I managed to find the Farfetch ten steps away from where he's standing. This is a... fun puzzle. You have to guide the Farfetch back to its trainer by scaring it. I hope you enjoy getting interrupted every other second by a random encounter. I return the Farfetch'd and the boss rewards me with HM Cut. I teach it to Serpent. HMs are still irritating as usual, but they have been improved by a marginal amount from Generation 1. You can now use most HM moves in the overworld. You no longer need to keep going into the menu to use them. Route 34 is up next. Here I find a Rattata. I spent a concerning amount of time trying to come up with a good nickname, and I ultimately went with Rascal. It's... fine. This route is where you find the daycare center, which is now tied to a new mechanic, breeding. You can now leave off two Pokémon here instead of just one, and if those Pokémon are compatible, there is a chance they will produce an egg. 
Whatever hatches from the egg depends on... stuff. This is actually a very complex system, but in all honesty, I've never really bothered with breeding Pokémon. I view it as something meant for competitive players. Breeding is usually the only way to get Pokémon with certain moves or stats. It doesn't really mean much for a player like me, and I think that's fine. Just don't expect me to give an essay about the topic of Pokémon intercourse. The daycare man does give you a free egg if you talk to him, though, so that's nice. Goldenrod City is the largest city in the game, and naturally, I have quite a lot of things to say. The first thing I do is get the bike. The only reason the bike even exists is because our character refuses to run any faster than this. Unlike Pokémon Red and Blue, I do think the bike is more useful here. You can register it to the select button, meaning you don't have to keep going into the bag to use the bike. Speaking of the bag, it got a major overhaul here. The bag now separates things into categories. Items, Pokéballs, TMs, and key items. The bag can also hold much more items than before, though there is still a limit. This is the style they use for the rest of the series, and it is much better than what Pokémon Red had to offer. I do still sometimes run out of item space, but it's nowhere near as frequent or annoying. I head to the Goldenrod Radio Tower and complete this quiz. The person rewards me with a radio card, giving the Pokégear some extra functionality. I haven't mentioned the Pokégear yet, have I? It's basically a glorified cell phone. You can call other characters with it, and if you talk to certain trainers, you can register their phone numbers. The Pokégear does do other stuff, though. With the radio card, you can tune into channels and replace the background music if you want. The map card is another upgrade you can get. It allows the Pokégear to display a map. Pretty straightforward. The Pokégear is superfluous. But I kinda like it. I think it has interesting functionality, and you know, this game was made in a time before mobile phones were common. The only annoying thing is that when you get a call, it pauses the game completely. It didn't happen too frequently for me, but it's still something to note. Goldenrod City also has a department store, a game corner, an underground area, and even a gym. Oh my god, this place is just Celadon City again! Anyway, about the gym itself. This place is pretty infamous for being a difficulty spike, and that is impressive considering it's a normal type gym. But, if you remember, we just got access to the daycare. So you know what that means. That's right, it's grind time, baby! I drop off a few Pokémon and begin running around in circles. While doing this, the egg I was carrying hatched. The egg contained Igglybuff, a baby Pokémon. Baby Pokémon are... Uh... Well, I don't like them. I was gonna nickname the Igglybuff Guildmaster because Mystery Dungeon, but it didn't fit, sadly. I went with Taffy instead. I trained up Rascal and Tubat. Rascal evolved into Raticate, and Tubat became Golbat. Now that I have a Golbat, my next step is to run around in circles again. This time, I'm not just doing it so my Pokémon in the daycare level up. I'm actually doing this to raise friendship! I know I've been spouting out a lot of information here, like about the breeding mechanics and the Pokégear, so I'll try to keep this section brief. To explain as quickly as possible, Friendship is a hidden mechanic that measures a Pokémon's attachment to their trainer. This game introduced several new ways Pokémon can evolve, and one of those ways is tied to having high friendship. Friendship can be raised in several ways, like winning Pokémon battles or using certain items, but the easiest way to raise happiness is by walking around. Every 512 steps, your Pokémon's friendship will increase by one point. Therefore, if you run around for long enough, you'll max out the friendship stat. While the friendship stat itself is hidden, there is a person in Goldoran who will measure the friendship of each of your Pokémon. You got all that? Because I'm not repeating myself. Igglybuff and Togepi also evolve with high friendship, which is nice, but for now I'm only focusing on Tubat. A couple of hours later, Tubat evolved into Crobat. My main strategy for the gym battle is to use Tubat's Confuse Ray, and kinda just hope it all works out. Will this strategy work? Let's find out. I'm actually talking over a gym battle for once. Wow! Whitney is the gym leader in Goldenrod, and she starts with a Clefairy. Oh, so that's what they look like. The Clefairy can be potentially dangerous, since it uses Metronome to pull out a random move. I've never had much trouble with it, though. Too bad takes it out. Now we have the actual main threat, Miltank. Just take a look at its moveset. This Miltank can heal itself, immobilize your Pokémon, and get stronger over time with Rollout. I begin with Confuse Ray. The Miltank hurts itself in its confusion. I then choose Bite, and luckily the Miltank hurts itself again. Then I use Bite again, and the Miltank... flinches. And then I use Bite one more time, and the Miltank faints. Wow, this was really underwhelming. Route 35 is up north. Here I encountered a Growlithe. Growlithe is always a Pokémon that I've wanted to use, but I've never had a good opportunity to. But now, in this playthrough, I finally have an excuse to...
Okay, fine. I didn't want to growl this anyway. I think this is a good opportunity to explain one of the biggest additions to Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal. Time-based mechanics. These games use an internal battery to keep track of time, which is why they ask you about the time at the beginning of the game. If you play the game during the day, well then the world will be day. If you play the game at night, then the world will also be at night. This mechanic is more than just an aesthetic change, of course. In fact, it affects a lot of stuff. Let's take Route 35, for instance. There is a police officer on this route. During the day, he will just stand there and do nothing. At night, however, he'll actually fight you. The Pokémon you can encounter in the grass will also change depending on the time. The buried trees you pick from will regenerate after a day. There are more things affected by the day and night cycle, but the point is, I really love this mechanic. It becomes a mainstay from Gen 4 onwards, and I think we take it for granted. If you ask people about their favorite thing about gold, silver, and crystal, it probably isn't the day and night cycle. Sadly, I do my recordings in the afternoon, so you won't be seeing the night too often. The National Park is up ahead. This is another place that makes use of time. You can go into the park at any time, but the bug catching contest is hosted here on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. I didn't catch anything here. I like the music, though. Route 36 has a suspicious tree in the way. This lady here tells me that the tree doesn't like water, and she heads back to her sister in Goldenrod. Her sister will only help you if you have the gym badge. That seems incredibly stupid, but alright then. I get a squirt bottle, and I return to the tree. Fun fact, the squirt bottle is shaped like a squirtle, and I think that's adorable. Also, the tree is sentient, and it's not even a tree. Sudowoodo is one of my favorite Pokémon from this generation. It's a rock-type Pokémon that mimics a tree. I love the concept, and I love the name. I caught the Sudowoodo, and... Well, I named him Tree. I didn't realize it until after I got done recording, but I did technically break the Nuzlocke rules here. I'll explain at the end of the video, but basically, I should not have caught the Sudowoodo. I do want to take a second to talk about the Pokémon in this game. Pokémon Gold, Silver, and Crystal introduced 100 new Pokémon. It's not as much as the original game's 151 Pokémon, but it's still a hefty amount. But saying that there are 100 new Pokémon would be a bit misleading. This game introduced a lot of new evolutions for older Pokémon. Crobat is one example, but there's also Steelix, Blossom, Politoed, and the very creatively named Porygon 2. Additionally, to go along with the Pokémon breeding mechanic, some Pokémon got baby pre-evolutions. Igglybuff, Elekid, Magby, Smoochum, Cleffa, and of course, Pichu. So in truth, the number of actual, completely new Pokémon is much smaller than 100. With that said, I still love many of the Pokémon they introduced. Ampharos is great, Heracross is a good bug type, Quagsire is cute, and Skarmory is one of my favorite Pokémon of all time. I think the new Pokémon they added were great additions, and I love that they added evolutions to Pokémon that really needed it. But they also added baby Pokémon, so 6 out of 10. Defeating the Sudowoodo will open up the path. You could immediately go to the next town, or you could take the shortcut back to Violet City. I decided to backtrack for a bit. I traveled all the way back to Cherry Grove just to talk to the old man. I followed him around town, and I finally got the map card. I also went to Professor Elm and showed him the Togepi that hatched. He rewards my efforts with an Everstone, a held item that prevents a Pokémon from evolving. Gee, thanks. I could probably head to Azalea Town and check up on Kurt. Obviously, I didn't do that, but it would have been a good idea. I walked back to Route 36 and went left to Route 37. I managed to find another Growlithe. Okay, let's try this again. I despise you. At Critique City is a nice place. In the Poké Center, you can meet up with Bill, that one guy from the first game. He rambles on about time travel for quite a while, and I'm honestly not sure how to feel about that. Bill says he has to run back home to Goldenrod. I recommend you follow him back, because if you do, Bill will give you a free Eevee. This time, I nicknamed the Eevee Muffin. Eevee is another exception to the not using Pokémon I've already used rule, because just like Golbat, Eevee has a new evolution. In fact, Eevee has two new evolutions, Umbreon and Espeon. You can see both of them at the Ecritique Dance Theater. There are five Kimono Girls here, and each use one of the Eevee Lucians. Umbreon is a Dark-type Pokémon, and Espeon is a Psychic-type. Both forms need high friendship to evolve, but for Espeon, Eevee has to level up during the day, while for Umbreon, Eevee must level up at night. I wasn't sure which evolution I wanted yet, so Muffin is just gonna sit in the party and do absolutely nothing. 
The Burnt Tower is another point of interest in Ecruteek. This place has a lot of lore associated with it, and it's where the legendary beasts originate, Entei, Raikou, and Suicune. There's a few people inside the tower. There's this guy, Yuzin, who is... We also have the gym leader, Morty, who looks more like Solid Snake than anything else. I found a coughing inside the building and caught it. I couldn't come up with a good nickname. Uh, fun fact, in the beta of Pokemon Red and Blue, coughing and wheezing were named NY and LA respectively. This is in reference to New York and Los Angeles' polluted air. And personally speaking, I thought that was funny as hell. I spotted Edgy the Hedgy at the center of the tower. I took one good look at my team, realized that over half of them were normal types, and concluded that this was not going to work. I swapped out Clefairy with Tree. I considered adding Los Angeles, but he was too low level to be useful in the fight. The fight against Shadow went fairly well. The Magnemite was kinda scary at first, but it turns out that Tree knows Low Kick, so it wasn't any issue. And then I died. Below the tower lies the three legendary beasts. They run away immediately. Boy, I sure do hope finding and catching them is gonna be really fun and not tedious in the slightest! Yuzine talks to me, I think. I, I wasn't paying attention. My focus was on the next gym. Morty uses Ghost-type Pokémon. Ghost-types are weak to Dark-type moves. I may not have a Dark-type Pokémon yet, but Tubat and Crunkle both know Bite, which is now Dark-type in this game. Tubat sweeps Morty's team by being the fastest thing alive. Morty got like two hits off. That is pathetic. With the fourth gym badge in our possession, we can now use HM Surf. Oh, by the way, you get HM Surf from this guy while at the Ecruteague Dance Theater. So, uh, yeah. Now that we have Surf, a few areas open up. The place I'm most interested to revisit is Union Cave. Only on Fridays, you can find the Lapras at the bottom here. Surf is required to fully explore Union Cave. I was planning on catching this Pokémon. I may have Crunkle already, but Lapras is still a pretty good Pokémon. There's just one small issue with my plan. I'm an idiot. If you remember, I caught Tubat in Union Cave, meaning that I've already got my encounter for this place, and therefore, I'm not allowed to catch this Lapras. Whoops. I have effectively wasted my time coming back here. I thought about going to Azalea Town since I was already close by. I still didn't do that, but in hindsight, I probably should've. Back at Ecrotic, I trained up Muffin until he evolved into Umbreon. I actually prefer Espeon in most cases, but I chose Umbreon for a simple reason. Let's play a fun game called Guess How Many Dark-Type Pokémon Are Available to the Player During the Main Story. The answer is 1, Umbreon. I will never understand this decision, but almost every Dark-Type Pokémon can only be caught in the post-game. Murkrow, Houndour, the Tyranitar line, all found in routes you don't explore in the main story. Sneasel can be found in the Ice Path and Crystal, but in Gold and Silver, post-game only. The fact that this applies to nearly all the Dark-type Pokémon leads me to believe that it was done intentionally. But why? Was it to make the Dark-type seem more special or something? I have no clue. It's just a bizarre choice that I don't understand. The point is, Umbreon is the only Dark-type Pokémon I can get, so that's what I'm going with. Ecruteague City has two paths. On the left is Route 38, while on the right is Route 42. I picked left. Route 38 has nothing to note, but Route 39 has the Moo Moo farm. There's a sick Miltank here who needs a berry. Welp, I've done all I can do. Route 39 was also the place I caught a Magnemite. I briefly mentioned Magnemite in the previous video. In Pokémon Red, it was a pure electric type, but starting from this game, the Magnemite line gains the steel typing. I named the Pokémon Magnus. Magnemite was a good Pokémon to capture here, because the next few areas will have quite a few Water-type Pokémon. Route 39 ends at Olivine City. I bump into Shadow, who thankfully doesn't fight me. He says the gym leader is at the lighthouse taking care of a sick Pokémon. The lighthouse is... interesting. I mean, I suppose it looks like a lighthouse. This place was good training for Magnus. He was quickly catching up with the rest of the team. Crunkle decided to one-up him, though, and evolved into Feraligator. Yes, that is how it's spelt, and it's only because of the character limit. That is ridiculous. At the top of the lighthouse, I find an Ampharos and the gym leader, Jasmine. She asks me to go get medicine at Cyanwood City, and to get there, I have to swim across the ocean. Let's go to Route 40. If you go up north from here, you can find something called the Battle Tower. I'm assuming this is a precursor to the Battle Frontier in Pokémon Emerald. I'm not actually sure, I didn't bother going into it for this playthrough. One thing I always appreciate about Pokémon games is that they usually have a bunch of optional side content. 
the Battle Tower, the Game Corner, Breeding, the Safari Zone, which isn't actually in this game, and of course we have multiplayer stuff like battling and trading. I love when games add minigames and optional side content like this. Even if I ignore most of it. Route 40 is just a beach that leads into the water. A lot of trainers are out on the ocean, and I would like to remind you that Magnus is an electric type. I'm not really a fan of sea routes. They're very open-ended, sure, but there's usually not much to find out in the water. Plus, assuming you're not using repels, you're gonna get stopped by random encounters constantly. And since it's, you know, the ocean, you pretty much fight exclusively water-type Pokémon. There aren't many water routes in this game, so it's not a big deal. But I want you to keep these points in mind for when I eventually get to Pokémon Emerald in like, 20 years. Cyanwood isn't too large of a place. If you go up north, you'll find a- oh. N nah, I think I'm good. There is a gym in this city, but I'm not actually gonna challenge it just yet. The gym here is fighting type themed, and as much as I like the team I currently have, it's not really well suited against fighting types. Too bad is level 28 and still doesn't know a single damn flying type move. The next three gems will be pretty difficult with my current team setup, but on the upside, you are allowed to challenge them in whatever order you want. I'll come back to Cyanwood later, but for now, I just grabbed the medicine from this guy. I returned to Olivine City, and I had to go up the entire lighthouse again. By the way, why does this place have holes in the floor? Jasmine uses the medicine to heal the Ampharos. This was... fun, I guess? I can now go and fight Jasmine if I wanted to. She specializes in Steel-type Pokémon, and once again, I don't feel like my team is properly prepared for this gym. So instead, I traveled all the way back to Ecratique and headed east to Route 42. Route 42 is a unique route. You can just go across the water, or you can make a detour to this cave, Mount Mortar. Mount Mortar is quite expansive, but to fully explore it, you need some HMs that you don't get until much later. Mount Mortar is optional, as it just leads to the other side of Route 42. I really like the waterfall here, though. On the main route, I found a Spearow and actually caught it. Does this mean I finally get to use a Spearow? The answer is yes! But not right now! Mahogany Town is up next, and it literally has like four buildings. This guy is blocking the entrance to the gym, and he tells me to go to the Lake of Rage up north. I mean, uh, okay. On Route 43, I found a... Damn it. I've noticed that the trainers and Pokemon on these routes are pretty underleveled compared to where my team is at now. I think this was done intentionally, since you can go here immediately after you beat the Ecratique Gym. But I also believe it leads to issues with the level curve. You'll see what I mean later. Right before I entered the Lake of Rage, Magnus evolved into Magneton. I think this one's upside down. The Lake of Rage is... a lake. Wow, incredible. The people around the area note that there's a red Gyarados in the center of the lake, and how Gyaradoses are rare to see. The red Gyarados is a shiny Pokémon. Shiny Pokémon were yet another new mechanic added to Generation 2. For every Pokémon you find, there is a small chance that they'll appear in a different color. I always thought shiny Pokémon were created to demonstrate the power of the Game Boy Color. Like, wow, Pokémon appearing in different colors? You can't do that on a regular Game Boy even though Gold and Silver can be played on a regular Game Boy. When I say shiny Pokémon are rare, I do mean rare. They have gotten easier to find over the years, but in their debut, 1 in 8,192. Yeah, needless to say, the Red Gyarados was likely your first introduction with a shiny Pokémon. I murdered the Gyarados in cold blood. After that's done, I find this guy. His name is Lance, and he definitely has no relation to the Lance in the first game. He suspects that the Magikarp and the lake are being forced to evolve with a radio signal, and he asks me to help him out. Lance fucking ascends into heaven while I take the long way back to Mahogany Town. Lance storms into this building and uncovers the entrance to the Team Rocket HQ. On the first floor, there's these statues. When you walk by them, two Rocket Grunts will fight you. They always have the exact same Pokémon, so I like to think these are the exact same Rocket Grunts I keep fighting. There is a secret switch that disables all the statues. It's a good thing I found it after I went past every single one. The HQ is a very standard dungeon otherwise. It doesn't throw anything too crazy at you. I talked to this scientist guy who mentions that he used to work at the Sylphco before joining Team Rocket. By the way, here's a pro tip coming from me. Don't fight this guy. He may only have two Pokémon and both are low-level coughings, but here's the thing. I'll be frank, I have no idea how my Pokémon survived this. 
At one point in the base, I ran into Shadow. He still doesn't fight me, but he mentions how Lance said he treats his Pokemon poorly. And then he calls me weak again, because that's just something Shadow likes to say. I talked to this guy, and he claims that their leader, Giovanni, is absolutely definitely gonna come back. I kinda doubt that. The Rocket Executive shouldn't be too much trouble. He has three Pokemon, and they're all pretty weak. I beat the Executive, and he leaves. The Murkrow here gives me a password. I do some backtracking to this area and enter the password. Surprise! Another Rocket Executive battle. Like before, this fight shouldn't give you any issue. Lance is back finally, and he helps you destroy the machine transmitting the radio signals. You just need to take out three electrodes. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, here's the funny part. Team Rocket retreats, and the Mahogany Town's gym is now open for business. I now have three gyms available to me, so I suppose it's time I finally start challenging them. Let's start with Chuck, the fighting type gym leader in Cyanwood. I would like to mention that I still don't have Fly at this point, so I had to travel all the way to Cyanwood by foot. I said in the last video that the Celadon gym needs you to use Cut, making it the only time an HM was required inside a gym. It turns out I was wrong, because Chuck's gym has boulders that require you to use HM strength. I don't have strength. One Google search later, and I learned that you can find strength at Olivine City. Oh man, I love surfing back and forth between these two cities. I got strength and I taught it to Serpent because... Wow, his moveset is bad. I can now progress through the gym. Too bad decides now would be a great time to finally learn a flying type move, Wing Attack. This move got a major buff in this game. Originally, it only had 35 power. That is genuinely terrible. Now it has 60 power, which is pretty alright. The question is, would Wing Attack be enough for the gym battle? The answer is... yes. Poor Chuck couldn't even get a single attack in. Thanks for the gym badge, dude. I am never coming to this place again. I was feeling proud after my win over Chuck. I would even say... arrogant. This is why I decided fighting Jasmine immediately after the fifth gym would be a great decision. This was a mistake. The gym doesn't have any other trainers. It doesn't have any puzzles. It's just you and her. The game gives you a false sense of security. Jasmine uses Steel-type Pokémon. Steel-types have the most resistances out of any type, but they aren't really known for their offense. They're only super effective against Rock and Ice. I didn't know that at the time, though, which is why I led with Tree. He was the only one with a move effective against Steel, Low Kick. Now, the question is, would Low Kick be enough for the gym battle? And the answer is... No. I panicked and switched to Muffin. I figured Muffin would be the best Pokémon to tank a hit. Umbreon is a Pokémon with very respectable defense stats. And upon sending him out... Oh shit. For the remaining Pokémon, I used Magnus and Crunkle. Crunkle wiped out the Steelix, and Magnus dealt with the remaining Magnemite. I got the Gym Badge, but it's a bit of a hollow victory. Well now... It took a while, but we finally have our first deaths in the playthrough. I put Tree and Muffin into the box. As for who will replace them, I took out Arrow in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is level 35, because I accidentally left him in the daycare for too long. I took the time to evolve Los Angeles into Weezing, and Arrow into Firo. I knew that for the next gym, I needed to be more prepared. The Mahogany Town gym uses Ice types, the most offensive typing in the game. My team as it is, wouldn't do that well. I did have a plan. I went to the Goldenrod department store, bought the TM for Fire Punch, and taught it to Serpent. By the way, when I was at Goldenrod, I noticed that there were more Team Rocket grunts in the city. It's a cute detail that foreshadows what happens later in the story. Next up, I flew to Azalea Town and bought Charcoal. This item makes Fire-type moves stronger. I could probably check up on Kurt while I'm here. Nah, it's fine. I got Serpent up to level 40 and gave her the Charcoal. Serpent is now a surrogate Fire-type member, only because Growlithe refused to cooperate. I think level 40 will be more than enough. For its stats are a bit crap, but the higher level should balance it out. The Mahogany Town Gym is just one giant sliding puzzle, nothing special. The leader here is Price, and he leads with a seal. I took out the seal with Magnus, and switched to Serpent once he brought out Piloswine. I believe this is the first time I've seen a trainer actually use an item during a battle, and it caught me a bit off guard, not gonna lie. Honestly, I didn't even think the mechanic was implemented, because I don't remember trainers in the first game use healing items either. Aside from that, the battle was smooth sailing. I get a call from Professor Elm as I step out of the gym. 
It seems that Team Rocket has hijacked the radio tower and are now broadcasting a message in an effort to contact Giovanni. Cool, not my problem. Route 44 didn't seem to have tall grass at first, but it actually does. You just need to go to the center of the lake. I found a bell sprout, woo. Route 44 leads into the snow path, one of my favorite locations in the Johto region. It's a cave made completely of ice. It stands out visually from the rest of the game. I do remember having a lot of trouble with this area as a kid. I think I got stuck on the strength puzzles, but now I can get through this area no problem. On the second floor, I caught a Swinub. Swinub is adorable. I'm developing a habit where I'm just nicknaming Pokemon after random sweets and food. In this case, we have Coco. I don't have an escape rope on me, so I had to trek back to Mahogany Town just to swap Arrow for Coco. I spent half an hour training up Arrow, and I never even got to use him. I am only mildly bitter. As I stated before, the Snowpath has strength puzzles. I like what they did here. You first have to push the boulders into these crevices, and once you go down the floor, you now have to use those boulders to navigate through the ice. This is the first time I think strength was used in an interesting fashion, and it only took me like 40 hours to get here. Oh, and also, the HM for Waterfall is just sitting here. <laughs> like, like what the hell? The snowpath leads to Blackthorn City. This place has the final gym, but who cares because we also gain access to the move deleter. Finally, we can get rid of unwanted HM moves. Right at the final city of the game. Well, it's better late than never. I went south of the city because I believe this area is the only opportunity to encounter a Skarmory. Oh boy, let's see what we find! I mean, I'm not sure what I was expecting. The Blackthorn Gym is north of the city, but I actually can't enter right now. I can only presume that the gym leader is on their lunch break. Well, I don't have anything better to do. So I've just decided that Team Rocket is now my problem. Let's go fight them. Team Rocket has hijacked the radio tower in Goldenrod. I head to the tower and fight the grunt on the first floor. He comes at me with a level 24 eradicate. I do not get the leveling here. Keep in mind that to trigger this event, you need to have seven gym badges. The last three gym leaders had Pokemon at or above level 30. The game knows I can handle level 30 Pokemon, but the Rocket Grunts refuse to use Pokemon above the mid 20s. The Rocket Executives do use higher level Pokemon, but most of them don't even have a full team. What I'm trying to say is that for this part of the game, I am just steamrolling everything without a challenge. Anyway, I reach this part of the tower and find the director. Except it's actually a Rocket Executive in disguise. Oh wow, this guy has a full team of six Pokemon. This could actually be a real chal- He has five coughings and a wheezing, you'll be fine. The Rocket Executive tells me that the real director is in the underground warehouse. And then he hands me the keys. It's good to know that in the three year time span, Team Rocket did not get any smarter. I found the entrance to the warehouse. I use the key and then I get ambushed by Shadow. He only has five Pokemon and the majority of them are unevolved. What did he expect to happen? Shadow broods for a bit, says that maybe he's been treating his Pokemon poorly, and he leaves. I think that was character development just now. You have this puzzle obstructing your path. You hit these switches and depending on which order you activate them, it will open up different pathways. The solution is really easy. 3, 2, 1, boom, there you go. This puzzle took me way longer to get through than I'd like to admit. I find the director who gives me a card key. The card key allows access to the remaining parts of the radio tower. Thanks. Uh, bye. I return to the radio tower. There are a few rocket executives with higher level Pokemon, but again, they shouldn't be too much trouble. Coco evolves after one of these fights, so that's nice. At the very top, there is only one rocket executive remaining. He boasts for a bit, and then the match begins. Being the final rocket battle in the main story, naturally he of course only has three Pokemon. Okay then. You might be saying, well if he only has three Pokemon, are they really high leveled and difficult? Uh, no, not really. He has a Houndour and a Houndoom, and they both died before they got a chance to do anything. He also has a coughing. Yes, a coughing, not even a wheezing. Unsurprisingly, I beat the Rocket Executive. Like what Giovanni did beforehand, he disbands Team Rocket. The director comes in and hands me a clear bell for my troubles. And that is the end of Team Rocket. Well, that was underwhelming. I still stand by that I like Team Rocket, but a part of me does find the whole radio tower sequence… disappointing. There's some good buildup in foreshadowing, but everyone is really underleveled. And by the end, I feel like nothing happened. 
Once this whole fiasco is over with, I just continue on my gym badge quest, and no one seems to care about that one time Team Rocket hijacked an entire bloody radio station. Where the hell was Lance during all of this? Your rival hates Team Rocket, why doesn't he do something? Why does it feel like I'm the only person in this entire region who's doing anything? <sighs> At the end of the day, it's not a big deal. Pokemon isn't known to have deep narratives. I just feel like the radio tower could have been handled better. At the very least, you could increase the difficulty of the trainers here. And in fairness, I believe the remakes do increase the challenge a bit. I think with very few changes, you could make this part of the game so much more interesting. And as it is... <sighs> I don't like it. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Now that Team Rocket is done for, I can return to Blackthorn and challenge the gym. With everything we've been through, I'm sure that my team has received more than enough training to- oh goddammit. I think now is a good time to talk about this. Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal kinda have a crap level curve. It's the most infamous aspect of these games, and I'm only bringing it up now because I think this is the point where it starts becoming egregious. The Rocket Executive I just fought had his highest level Pokemon Houndoom at level 35. Now you got trainers here rocking Pokemon around that level and higher. The gym leader has a Pokemon at level 40. It's a weird jump, and yes, I am aware, I just got done complaining about how the Rocket Grunts had Pokemon with too low of levels, but now, I think the levels are too high. I'm pretty sure that no matter how you play this game, there will come a point where you have to spend an hour leveling up your team. Additionally, the fact that you can challenge three of the gyms in any order you want is a cool feature, but the game has to accommodate for that fact. What that means is that I feel like the wild Pokemon rarely go above level 20, and trainers don't get much better either. At some point, I just stop bothering catching Pokemon, because why should I? They're so underleveled that it's not worth taking the time to level them up, especially when I already have to worry about training up my current team. At least here, you do have a route that gives you wild Pokemon that aren't below level 20. You see, now you'll find Pokemon in the mid-20s. Cool. The Blackthorn Gym is themed around dragons. Dragon types are weak against other dragon types and ice types. Coco is an ice type, but he only has one incredibly weak ice type move. I do know where to get a stronger move, though. I flew back to Goldenrod again, and we're actually doing something different. Welcome to the Game Corner, also known as Gambling. The Game Corner is a way to get special TMs in Pokémon. You can only purchase these with coins, and although you can buy coins from the counter, it does get expensive quickly. The best way to get coins is, of course, playing the minigames. Here we have a slot machine, and I'm gonna be honest, I just straight up cheated because I don't have all day. You need 5,500 coins to buy just one of the three TMs from the counter. The TM I want is Blizzard. I bought the wrong thing. Blizzard's accuracy has been nerfed, but it's still a fine option for battling. At some point, I also taught Crunkle Icy Wind, which will also help. I got at least some of my team up to level 40, and I'm just gonna hope it will be enough. The Blackthorn Gym requires strength to push down these holes. If you got through the snow path, you can get through this. Gym battle time. The gym leader is Claire. Claire leads with the Dragonair, and I take it out using Crunkle. She then sends out a second Dragonair. I switch over the Coco and kill it. Now we have Kingdra. This is a tricky one. Kingdra is part water type, so ice type moves would now only do neutral damage. I wasn't really thinking when I prepared for this fight, and that's probably why this happened. I tried sending in Magnus to Thundershock it, and he almost died. My only plan now was switching into Crunkle to whittle away at Kingdra's HP. It took forever, but Crunkle did ultimately come out on top. Claire sends out her final Pokémon, Another Dragonair. Look, I get that there weren't a lot of Dragon-type Pokémon to choose from, but like, come on, did you really need to have three Dragonairs? Imagine if the Champion did something like this. Claire is flabbergasted that I managed to beat her with a Feraligator, and she refuses to give me the badge. Wow, what a sore loser. She says I need to go into the Dragon Den to prove myself. I'll go do that, but first I have to drop off Coco into the box. He barely did anything, but that's okay, I still love him. The Dragon's Den shouldn't be too bad. I mean, I just fought Claire. I don't think the trainers will be that high level- oh, never mind. You need Whirlpool to reach the shrine in the center. It's a good thing they introduced the move deleter in this town, because I am definitely getting rid of this as soon as I leave. In the shrine, you'll have to answer a few questions. The answers are actually important for something. 
Once you answer the questions, the guy will recognize your conviction. Claire enters the room, and she finally hands you the last badge. As you're leaving the shrine, Claire will hand you Dragon Breath. If you head back inside after this, you can talk to the guy in the center, and he'll hand you a- Wait, what? My party is full? What are you talking about? What the fuck? As I was saying, the guy in the center will hand you a Dratini. I nicknamed this one Aurora. Depending on what you answer in those questions from earlier, the Dratini can either have Leer or Extreme Speed. You receive it at level 15, though. Guess what I'm gonna do for the next 20 hours. I'm back home at New Bark Town, and I have a level 40 Dragonair. How long did this take? I'm glad you asked! If you check my current playtime, you'll see that I have way too many hours. You can talk to Professor Elm, and he'll give you a Master Ball. Not too useful for me, but you might find a use for it. I have all eight gym badges, which means it's time for the Pokemon League. I sailed on the water by my house and headed east. This is always a fun part of the game. You'll reach this guy, who will tell you that you have just taken your first steps into the Kanto region. Sure enough, if you go to your Pokegear, we are indeed now in Kanto. Granted, we are only exploring parts of Kanto that weren't accessible in the first game, but it is still, by technicality, the Kanto region. You have to go through a cave that I'm pretty sure only exists as an excuse to require Waterfall. Speaking of which, the animation for Waterfall is... incredible. The path to the Pokémon League is long. You have quite a few routes to go through before you even reach the reception gate. At least the game gives you a rest stop midway through. I feel the need to point out that the trainers here have Pokémon around the mid-30s, a little lower than what the trainers had in the Dragon's Den. I don't understand this game. I get to the Pokémon League reception gate. I show my badges, and the guy lets me through. We're not at the Pokémon League just yet. We have one more obstacle in our path. Victory Road. Victory Road is... Well, it's something, alright. I called the Victory Road in Pokémon Red underwhelming, but you know, at least it had trainers. This place has nothing going for it. There are no trainers, and you don't even need any HMs to get through. It feels like Victory Road was added at the last minute, especially considering how short it was. Okay, I suppose there is one trainer here. When you reach the exit, which took me 30 seconds to find, Shadow the Hedgehog will appear and stop you. He claims to have the strongest Pokémon, but his team still has a few unevolved members. Guess what happened? Yeah, I killed his team. Shadow contemplates his life choices and says he'll return for a rematch someday. This is our last encounter with the rival in the main story. If it feels like his character arc is incomplete, that's because it is. I know I've been kinda joking about the rival throughout the video, but I do genuinely think he's one of the best rivals in the series. This was the last time Pokémon had a real jerk rival. Starting with Emerald, the rival characters would be more friendly and supportive. Whether or not this was a good thing, I'll leave it up to you. They have had more asshole characters since, like Gladion and Bede, but these games still have a friendlier character to balance it out. Shadow, whose canonical name is Silver, is my favorite rival. I think he has the most compelling character arc. He starts off being an asshole who treats his Pokémon poorly, and by the end, he mellows out. One of his Pokémon is a Golbat, and if you remember, Golbat only evolves with high friendship. The reason he doesn't use a Crobat is because he still hasn't learned how to treat his Pokémon properly. I think that's a really cool detail. Silver may not be the deepest Pokémon character, but I still like him. And considering the other rivals in the series, I do think he's the best overall. I have finally reached the Pokémon League. There's a Poké Center, a Mart section, and the staircase leading to the Elite Four. If you need to go back to Johto, there's also an old man who will teleport you there. Now that I got to the League, it's time to do even more training! Yep, the levels for the Elite Four jump up a bit. The Champion's Pokémon are close to level 50, and my team is only around the early 40s. The first thing I do is go gambling again. This time I bought the Thunder TM to teach to Magnus. You may be thinking to yourself, wouldn't it be a better idea to teach Magnus Thunderbolt, a move with much better accuracy? And yes, that is a very good idea. I have no idea where Thunderbolt is. I changed up my other Pokémon's movesets, like giving Crunkle Earthquake and giving Serpent Rest and Sleep Talk. I did training on the routes leading up to the Pokémon League. These are my Pokémon's final levels. Everyone is at least level 43, which should be good enough. I still have five rare candies, though, and I gave them all to Aurora so he would evolve. And then I remembered Dragonair evolved at level 55, so I did even more training. Boom, there we go, a level 55 Dragonite. Did I need to do this? Maybe. Aurora will probably be the MVP, but I mainly want to save him for the champion battle. I think I've done all the preparations I can do, so let's not waste any more time. Here we go. The first Elite Four member is Will. He uses Psychic-type Pokémon. 
The most challenging Pokemon on this team was unexpectedly Jinx. I tried using Fire Punch with Serpent and he almost died. I tried switching to Magnus and he almost died. For this fight, I spammed Bite with Crunkle and that seemed to do the trick. The next member is Koga. This guy was originally a gym leader in Pokemon Red. He has since been promoted to an Elite Four member. Koga specializes in poison types, but he also has a few bug Pokemon. Serpent took out a chunk of his team. For the remaining Pokemon, I had Magnus out. Very easy fight, all things considered. Third opponent is Bruno, an Elite Four member from the first game. Too bad eliminated most of his team, until Bruno decided to pull out his signature fighting type Pokemon, Onix. I took out Onix with Crunkle, who's beginning to feel more like the real MVP. When Hitmon Lee came up, for some baffling reason, I thought Magnus could handle it. I then remembered Steel types were weak to fighting, and Magnus nearly dies for the third time in this video. Another easy fight otherwise. The final Elite Four member is Karen, the Dark type specialist. I don't have a great counter against Dark types. This battle had me switching between my Pokemon constantly, and a few even got close to dying. It was honestly the most invigorating battle in the game. I got through the Elite Four with miraculously no deaths. Even Serpent survived, and I'm not sure how. Only one opponent remains, the Pokemon League champion, Lance. Wow, who could have seen that coming? Lance leads with a Gyarados, and I use Thunder with Magnus. He then sends out Dragonite. Lance has a total of three Dragonites, with different moves for each of them. In this case, Lance sent out his level 50 Dragonite, which is also his ace Pokemon. Interesting tactic. I was hoping to get off another Thunder, but the Dragonite outsped me. I didn't want to use Aurora right away, so I tried weakening it first with Crunkle. I selected Icy Wind, and Crunkle ended up taking out the Dragonite himself. Huh. Lance chooses another Dragonite, and it goes down in a similar fashion. This Dragonite had Thunder, and I thought Crunkle was dead, but nope, he powered through it like a champ. Lance then sends out his third Dragonite. Okay, sure, bud. After that comes Charizard. I would like to remind you that Crunkle is a Water-type Pokemon. Charizard explodes, and Lance sends out Aerodactyl. It may not technically be a dragon, but it's still weak to Icy Wind. I defeat Aerodactyl, and then... Wait, that was his last Pokemon? Oh. Well, that was anticlimactic. Look, I gotta be honest, Lance. I think your Pokemon Red team was harder. Uh, anyway. After the fight, Professor Oak and someone named Mary congratulate me. Lance ushers me to the Hall of Fame, and just like that, I have become the new Pokemon Champion. My final team is Crunkle the Feraligator, Serpent the Furret, Tubat the Crobat, Los Angeles the Pokemon that did absolutely nothing, and Aurora the Dragonite. I spent two hours leveling up Aurora and I didn't even use them in the final battle. For those who died, we have Tree the Sudowoodo, Muffin the Umbreon, Coco the Piloswine, and Magnus the Magneton. Only four deaths, that really impresses me. My final playtime is 62 hours and 15 minutes. My Pokedex rating is... okay. And that is the end of Pokemon Crystal. Well, sort of. With the main story complete, we can now do the post-game. And, uh... Huh. The Generation 2 games, as well as the remakes, debatably have the longest and most elaborate post-games in the franchise. You gain access to the Kanto region. You can explore the region in its entirety, as well as challenge all the gym leaders. It's essentially the second half of the game. Here's the thing. These videos are primarily about my thoughts on the game, and at this point, I've kinda said everything I've wanted to say. I've already played through Kanto, and I don't think I have much to add by continuing beyond this point. Because of that, I'm actually going to stop here. Maybe in the future I'll make a video about the post-game. But for now, just keep in mind that my final thoughts here are purely in regards to the main story. With that said, I still really enjoyed Pokémon Crystal. I think it's a major improvement from the first game. The fundamental systems haven't changed, but Pokemon Crystal adds a bunch of quality of life improvements while also introducing new mechanics and ideas. Of course, that isn't to say it doesn't have problems. After I beat the game, I can only think about how much time I wasted leveling up Pokemon, grinding for experience for hours on end. The level curve bogs the game down for the last few hours. I found the game to be much more challenging than Pokemon Red, and I like that, but I don't think it was entirely for the right reasons. From what I can remember, this issue persists in the remakes as well. Speaking of which, you may now be asking, can I recommend Pokemon Crystal over the remakes? Not really, if I'm honest. Heart Gold and Soul Silver retain what makes the original game special, and they add even more quality of life changes and mechanics. It's a shame, because otherwise, I could recommend this. 
While I think Pokemon Red and Blue have aged poorly in some aspects, I wouldn't say the same for Gold, Silver, and Crystal. I had a lot of fun playing this, and there is something charming about the old Game Boy graphics and sounds. Pokemon Crystal is a good game. It may not be my favorite, and there are some glaring flaws, but I still enjoyed my time here. But yeah, just play the remakes. And those are my thoughts on Pokemon Crystal. I genuinely thought this video would be shorter than my Pokemon Red video. Pokemon Emerald was originally going to be the next video after this, but seeing how much time it took doing these two games back to back, yeah, I'm gonna take a break from Pokemon for a bit. So thanks for watching, and tune in next time where I'll be talking about Metroid Dread, baby! Hell yeah! Hi. Before anything, I did say earlier that I unintentionally broke the Nuzlocke rules, so let me explain. If you remember, on Route 36, I caught a Bellsprout and traded it for an Onyx. This happened very early on in the video. Later on, I caught and used a Sudowoodo. What I didn't realize until now is that the Sudowoodo was on Route 36. That whole area counts as the same route, so... Yeah, technically I broke the rules there. Whoops. Regardless, I still hope you enjoyed the video at least. I guess that's one thing I didn't really bring up in the video. My thoughts on Nuzlocking this game. My general thoughts are, I don't think you need to do a Nuzlocke to get a decent challenge. But I still found doing the Nuzlocke fun, so I'd still recommend trying it out at some point. Anyways, uh, can I say that this video is, uh, kinda long? I thought the last video was a behemoth, but ugh, my god, this one was ridiculous. These longer videos do take a bit out of me, especially when recording the audio. I start losing my voice after a bit. I'm gonna make some shorter, simpler videos, and is that a plane? Oh my god. I'm gonna make some shorter, simpler videos for now. Pokemon Emerald will come eventually, just not anytime soon. I guess the last thing I should ask is this. Would you guys be interested in a video about Pokemon Crystal's post-game? Personally, I don't think it would make for an interesting video, but I'm not opposed to the idea either. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching, and... I'm going to bed.